the Elder Grant for another uh, very pertinent topic. Uh, speaking about fools in this foolish world is something that we all need to understand how to deal with. Seems like there's more and more every day. Um, so we are going to continue on with uh, our understanding of the Trinity in the Old Testament. I'm going to do a quick review for us and hopefully get us uh, back on the track of thinking through the topic. The la yes, please, thank you. <laughs> Yes, let me pray for our transition. Thank you. Heavenly Father, we thank you for um, the word that we received today. Lord God, we ask that you would give us wisdom as we walk in this world. Help us to understand how to deal with those that are still in the world, uh, those that are still of the world. Lord God, give us um, understanding uh, through your scripture, just as was spoken to us um, this morning. Uh, don't just allow us to be hearers, Lord God, but allow us to take your word out into the world in our context and apply it as you would have us. Lord, uh, as we go into the scriptures now, I ask that you would help me to think clearly, to speak clearly, and help all others to hear your word and to understand it. Lord God, I ask that you would allow this word to go out to those whom you would have. Lord, I ask that you would go before and prepare hearts so that as we seek to evangelize those individuals that may be a part of Unitarian belief systems, Lord God, that they would see the truth of your word in your scripture. In Jesus' name, amen. Now to the review. All right. The last time we were together, we began setting up our discussion regarding the Trinity in the Old Testament. Our approach to this topic was to look at it from a perspective of evangelizing a Jewish individual. Through our discussion, we found that there would be some obvious roadblocks in the evangelization process. The first of these roadblocks we discussed was the Shema. This was the selection of Old Testament verses that the Jews gave great focus to. They began learning these verses as soon as they were able to speak. They recited them morning and evening, and they even sought to recite them prior to death. We found that the first verse of the Shema ends with the clause, the Lord is one. The Jews look to this verse and understand it to speak both to the being and personhood of God. They believe that God is, strict, is a strict unity, one in being and one in person. To get past this initial roadblock, we look to the meaning of the usage of the Hebrew term that was translated as one, akkad. We found that there are several senses in which the word can be understood. The most interesting to us, however, was the fact that akkad could be understood as a complex unity. The most, um, excuse me, sharing with our Jewish friends the the fact of this complex unity would hopefully allow them to understand that we can't stop the conversation there, that we can continue on with the conversation to look at more scripture. We then looked at the next roadblock, the fact that the Jews were given harsh, harsh threats from God concerning idolatry. God's recourse against one who would seek to turn him, his people away from him and toward other gods was death. The wicked counselor sparking rebellion against God was to die. It didn't matter who the culprit was, your husband, your wife, your son, your daughter, anyone. They were to be stoned to death. There were also strong threats not only to wicked counselors, but those that took heed to their wicked counsel. God was willing to wipe out entire cities if they decided to turn away from him in idolatry. The modern day Jew, knowing this, hears of Jesus Christ working amazing miracles but teaching of a God that is multi-personal. The Jew says in his or her mind, this is not the God of my fathers. This is not the God revealed to us in the Old Testament scriptures. I'm under the command of God to turn away from the new God that you are presenting to me. But here's the question. Does the Jewish person have a legitimate reason to turn away from the God proclaimed in the New Testament scriptures? Will the Jew be able to turn to God on the day of his judgment and say, you, God, you revealed to me a unitarian being. You told me that you were one person in one being. 
the reason I'm standing before you right now in judgment is because what you reveal in the New Testament is something strike, starkly different. In your word, you told me that I'm to turn away from anyone that is going to proclaim someone other than you, the one true God. If the Jew is right that God did not reveal himself as a multi-personal being in the Old Testament, it would seem to me that they have a legitimate gripe against God. But what we need to do is investigate if that's actually true. But this isn't really, it's, it's not just about being able to convince somebody that God is multi-personal. It's not even mainly about being able to bring that person to salvation. The more important thing is God's righteousness. If God is a righteous God, then this is something that cannot be leveled against him. Right? A Jew cannot be able to point at God and say, I'm going to hell because of you. You didn't give me the information that I needed to know, that I needed to have in order to be able to trust in Christ. Right? You told me, above all, I need to listen to prophets who would point me to the one true God. It doesn't matter how many prophecies they have that come true. It doesn't matter how many miracles they have. Right? If they are preaching a God that is not the God of my fathers, I have to reject them. And when I saw Jesus Christ, he's teaching his multi-personal God. He's saying he's the son, he's divine. How am I supposed to believe that? If this is true, then they have a legitimate right. Honestly, God forced his own hand. Right? He forced his hand. In order for God to be righteous, he had to reveal himself as being a multi-personal being. Right? And I believe that he did that, and I, and I hope that we can show that today. All right, so let's, let's begin to investigate these things. First, let's go over the goals. So what I would like to do is point out a few objections. Not going to go into them because we're going to be going into a whole bunch of scriptures, but uh, a few objective, uh, objections from the Jews. One is gonna, going to uh, be in the category of the substance of God. What's God made of? Is he spirit? Is he flesh? What? Is he material? Right? Uh, another one is about the nature of God. Right? Is he divine? Is he human? Right? And another is about the being of God and how we're to understand his personhood. Okay. The Jews believe God is spirit. They believe God is spirit. Theologically, we believe the same. Right? We believe the same. We can go even to the New Testament scriptures and see that that's absolutely true. God is spirit, and those who worship him must worship him in spirit and in truth. Okay, so we agree. We're on the same page. God is spirit. The Jews believe that. Christians believe that. But here's the question. Does this mean that God cannot reveal himself in a physical form? Okay. There are some sects of Jewish individuals that would say God is absolutely formless. He cannot take shape in a physical form. Okay. You could see how that would cause them to reject anything that's coming out of the New Testament. Right? If Jesus came to them in physical form, they would have to reject that. Well, that's, that can't be true because God cannot be formless. Excuse me, he cannot take form. Okay. Let's go ahead and look at a few verses that would teach us otherwise, and that should have taught these Jews that would believe that otherwise. All right, Genesis 3, 8 through 10. Genesis 3, 8. They heard the sound of the Lord God walking in the garden in the cool of the day, and the man and his wife hid themselves from the presence of the Lord God among the trees of the garden. Then the Lord God called to the man and said to him, where are you? He said, I heard the sound of you in the garden and I was afraid because I was naked, so I hid myself. All right, got some questions. What spurred Adam and Eve to duck and run for cover while they were in the garden? What caused them to do that? Yeah, they heard him. What was he doing? What was the Lord doing? He was walking. The Lord was walking. And not only was he walking, he was making sounds when he was walking. Okay. 
Sounds to me like there was some form. It doesn't say that he was in the form of the man. That's what I would imagine, but it doesn't say that. But at least to give objection to the fact that God cannot be any sort of a physical form, I think this thing is starting to do the trick. Okay. Here's, here's another question. Why didn't they think it was maybe some other animal, like a lion or a rabbit? It says they heard the sound of the Lord God walking. Right? It didn't say that they saw him, it said they heard his sound. Why didn't they think it was some other animal? This is common. It's common. Right? And then if you look at verse 10, it says, He said, I heard the sound of you in the garden. He knew this sound. This is, this is God's sound coming in the garden. Right? He knew the sound of God. Another question. Why did they actually hide? Why did they actually hide? Yeah, definitely because they disobey God. But here's a question. If God is spirit in a spiritual form, can you hide from him? Right? Can, you, can you hide behind some bushes to get away from the gaze of God? It'd be no point if he wasn't there and if he's just in a spiritual form. Right? This, is, this is pointing us to the understanding that God actually took form. He was embodied and he was walking in the garden. He was walking in the garden. Okay. And the interesting thing about this is that this was, was this before the fall or after the fall? Or before the sin or after the sin? Let me put it that way. This is after the sin. Right? So you can't say, well, this would only happen prior to and after it can't happen anymore. Right? What I'm thinking is along the lines of Miss Pam, it happened before and it happened after. God took form, and he walked in the garden with Adam and Eve. Okay. Any questions? Okay. One other thing that this, that this shows that's not really the focus right now, but obviously God, God was seen somehow by Adam and Eve, okay, because this is another objection that, that Jews would have, is that you cannot see God and live. Okay, so this would be another uh, text that we could turn to to show that that is the case. Okay, let's turn to another, 11, Genesis 11, 4 through 5. And I'm trying to do these in somewhat of an order, showing that from the very beginning, right, we're in Genesis chapter 3, and, and God is showing them about himself. He's teaching them about himself. Okay, Genesis chapter 11, verses 4 and 5. They said, come to us, build, ourse build for ourselves a city and a tower whose top will reach into heaven and let us make ourselves a name. Otherwise, we will be scattered abroad over the face of the whole earth. The Lord came down to see the city and the tower which the sons of men had built. Okay, this is another uh, a point to another objection that God is He's so transcendent above this physical universe that he can't even enter into this physical universe. Okay? Here we see the language came down in verse 5. The Lord came down to see the city. That is um, often used when God is about to act or if he's in, it, doing an investigation. Right? And um, I placed some other verses here if you wanted to jot those down. There are some other verses where that same type of language is used, where God is actually entering into his physical creation in order to either act or in order to present himself to his people. Okay. All right, let's go with one of those. I want to pull out one more of those, and that's Exodus 19.10. Exodus 19.10. This is another, um, this is when the Lord is presenting himself to his people, to the Israelites, prior to giving the Ten Commandments. So he had them consecrate themselves, 
they were to be ready for God entering in and presenting himself before them. It says, the Lord also said, this is Exodus 19.10, the Lord also said to Moses, go to the people and consecrate them today and tomorrow and let them wash their garments and let them be ready for the third day. For on the third day, the Lord will come down on Mount Sinai in the sight of all the people. In verse 11, did God tell his people that he was going to come down, but they wouldn't be able to see him? Obviously not, right? Because what does it say in verse 11? Yeah. It tells us that the Lord is going to come down on Mount Sinai in the sight of all the people, in the sight of all the people. Right? And in case we wanted to make that something spiritual, let's look to verse 18. Verse 18 says, Now Mount Sinai was all in smoke because the Lord descended upon it in fire. And its smoke ascended like the smoke of a furnace, and the whole mountain quaked violently. I think it's a good idea to associate God with fire because he reveals himself in that way. Uh, I don't think that they always associated him that, that way, though. One of the, at least the sect that we're thinking about now of Jewish belief, actually believes that this isn't possible, that God cannot come and reveal himself to his people in fire. He can't come into the physical world and reveal himself physically at all. Right? What we're doing here is we're seeing that God was teaching them that's wrong. That's a wrong thought to have about me, right? I'm revealing to you that I can actually enter into my physical creation. All right. Any other questions? Yes, not all the time. Absolutely. Yes. The cell is what he, what they recognize him. Are you saying the cell is the form? Okay. So what I'm saying is there had to be some physical form of God in in order for him to be able to interact with the physical surroundings to make noise, right? So and they and they and they looked. They heard that noise, and it was described by Moses as they heard the, they heard God walking. Right. Mm -hmm. Yes, uh, I, would, I would say that the sound in itself shows that God had to take some sort of a physical shape if it's described as walking, right? They heard it and they recognized it, not just as some random sound, they recognized it as God walking. The reason they ran was because he, Adam said, I heard the sound of you. I heard the sound of you. I know what you sound like, so I ran, right? So that's, that's what I'm trying to get at. Hmm? Uh, uh, you, you're not obviously trying to get every one of these, but would you throw uh, Exodus, Exodus 3, the burning bush? Absolutely. Category? Yeah, as, as make, uh, coming in a, into a physical form. Yeah, absolutely. And Exodus 3. Exodus 3, the burning bush. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, and I think that's another thing that we're going to have to touch on. So we yeah. Yes, sir. Yeah, I think when it comes to uh, scriptures that seem to differ in that regard, it's probably a, a degree of glory difference. I think that Moses saw a degree of glory that no one else got to see and just the back part of it whereas uh, with Adam and Eve it wasn't as anywhere near a great degree of glory that they saw or that they witnessed yeah I would agree uh, to an extent when uh, when God revealed himself to Moses when he was on the mountain and uh, he said he was going to place his hand in front of Moses 
and pass by him, I would, I would agree that he got a, a degree of, uh, of glory being shown from the Lord, yeah. I do think, think that there are some other intricacies to that, however, and we uh, hopefully will get there today. Okay, the next one is uh, Genesis fifteen seventeen. Okay, so this is, this is God, Genesis 15, where God is making his covenant with Abraham. And you probably already know where, where this is going. Uh, I'm going to read uh, 17. It says, it came about when the sun set that it was very dark, and behold, there appeared a smoking oven and a flaming torch which passed between these pieces. On that day, the Lord made a covenant with Abraham. I'm just going to stop there. Obviously, how did, how did God show up? Yeah, a smoking oven and a flaming torch, right? There was, there was a God, into, this is showing God entering into his physical universe, and he is in some physical form, okay? In some physical form. So this is, this is really taking care of this one objection that says God cannot take form. He can't, he, he's so transcendent, he can't even come into the physical reality that we live in. While we maintain that God is, excuse me, that God in his eternal existence is spirit, he makes it abundantly clear through his scripture that he can and is willing to enter into his physical creation and take on physical form. Anyone who chooses to disregard the clear teachings of scripture and believe that God is unable to be seen physically is free to do so. However, they will not be able to point the finger at God and claim he is at fault for their unbelief and subsequent judgment. Okay, so that is, that's the first one. So we know that God can enter into his creation and take physical form, okay? So no, it doesn't mean that God cannot reveal himself in a physical form, okay? It doesn't mean that. All right, on to our next one, and this is regarding the nature of God. What is God's ontology? Is he divine? Is he human? What is he? The Jews believe God transcends man, right? He's higher than man, right? Theologically, we know this to be true, right? We know it to be true. Romans 1 verse 20 says, for since the creation of the world, his invisible attributes, his eternal power and divine nature have been clearly seen, right? We know just by looking at creation that God is something other than human. He's higher than us at an extreme level, <laughs> to the infinite degree, right? He has eternal power, right? How you got power that starts in eternity? It doesn't make sense, right? He's, he has divine nature. It's clear, it's clear. So again, we would, we would agree, right? We would agree with the Jew that says, look, he's, he's totally above man, right? Here's the question though, does that mean that he can't reveal himself as a man? Right? Is that the case? Because in, this, in the same way that we agreed that God was spirit, the Jews take that, some of the Jews, a small segment actually, but some of the Jews would take that and say, because he's spirit, he cannot even enter into his creation. Okay? And in the same fashion, these individuals that say, well, God is divine, he's other than human, he would never, he would never reveal himself as a human. Right? That's where we would say, well, let's stop there. Right? We agree he's divine, but we're not going to say that he wouldn't reveal himself as human unless he told us that in his scripture. So let's go to his word and see how he, how he reveals himself. All right, Genesis 16, 5 through 13. Okay, so this is with uh, Abram and Sarah. And the context of this is where Abraham and Sarah had the terrible idea of trying to help God out and put a slave girl in the, as Abram's wife so that she could possibly bear the son that they had been promised, right? Obviously, this was not gonna go well. Uh, when Hagar conceived, 
uh, you, can, you can just know that she was extremely prideful. And because of that pride, uh, being intertwined with Sarai's jealousy, it didn't work out. Right? And Sarai, was, she was done with her, and she threw her out. You got to go, Hagar. Right? So that's, that's the context of this. Um, let me go ahead, and I'm going to start at verse 7. Right, Hagar is out. She's already, she's, she's fleed from the presence of Sarai, uh, of Sarai. And in verse 7 it says, Now the angel of the Lord found her by a spring of water in the wilderness, by the spring on the way to Shur. He said, Hagar, Sarah's maid, where have you come from and where are you going? And she said, I am fleeing from the presence of my mistress, Sarai. Then the angel of the Lord said to her, return to your mistress and submit yourself to her authority. Moreover, the angel of the Lord said to her, I will greatly multiply your descendants so that they will be too many to count. Verse 11, the angel of the Lord said to her further, behold, you are with child and you will bear a son and you shall call his name Ishmael because the Lord has given heed to your affliction. He will be a wild donkey of a man his hand will be against everyone, and everyone's hand will be against him. And he will live to the east of all his brothers. And finally, verse 13, then she called the name of the Lord who spoke to her, you are a God who sees. For she said, have I even remained alive here after seeing him? Okay, let's uh, do a little bit of investigation work through here. Uh, in verse 7, in verse 7, who does the text tell us that Hagar was speaking to? Yeah, yeah. The angel of the Lord is who she is having a conversation with, right? Um, this, this angel, um, and uh, this is kind of an aside, but the word angel in Hebrew is malak, and malak doesn't mean like an angel with wings. It means messenger. So it doesn't speak to the ontology or the nature of a being, right? It speaks to really the task that's at hand for that being. Uh, they are messengers at that time. Uh, human beings can be messengers. Um, uh, angels can be messengers. And God, as we'll see, can be called a messenger as well. I would say she saw a body. I would say she saw a body. Mm -hmm. And uh, so we'll, we'll, we'll probably touch on that as we're going through it. All right, so um, what did the angel of the Lord foretell about Hagar? Right now, we're kind of looking at the, the, the level of knowledge this being has, right? What did, what did he foretell about Hagar in verse 11? Yeah, gonna, gonna bear a son. Yeah, gonna bear a son. Yeah, and then she told him even more about the future in verse 11 and 12, right? He was gonna be a wild donkey of a man, be with everyone, uh, be against everyone, everyone would be against him, good, right? And then in verse 10, we see authority, right? We already saw great knowledge, now we see great authority. In verse 10, what did the angel of the Lord promise Hagar? Yeah, promise to greatly multiply her descendants. Who can make that type of a promise? Yeah, God can. God can, right? In, uh, in Job 12, 9, it says, Who among all these does not know that the hand of the Lord has done this, in whose hand is the life of every living thing and the breath of all mankind? Right? Believed what part? Yeah, I think she believed it, and I think that kind of is shown by how she reacted at the end. Uh, in verse 13, right? Um, what was her response? She said, you are a God who sees, right? And, 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 uh, and even after that, it, it, sh it shows how she truly thought that she saw God. Why? What, what happened after she, after she made that conclusion? What did she then say? She said, have I even remained alive here after seeing him? What did she think was, what was supposed to happen to her? She thought she was going to die. She thought she was going to die. Right. Um, looking back at, uh, I wanted to go back to where uh, the statement was made in, uh, in verse 10. Just to be clear, um, the, the angel of the Lord said, I will greatly multiply your descendants. 
right? This isn't an emissary sent on behalf of God in order to give a message to Hagar, right? This angel, uh, meaning messenger, is God because he is saying, I will do this. I will greatly multiply your descendants. God says that. Angels can't say that. Okay. Now, um, I think that there could be plenty of arguments to that. Um, and one of the main arguments that, I, one, one argument that I have heard about this is, okay, maybe she, she actually thought that this individual was God. Who's Hagar? She's just some little slave girl. She may have saw something, uh, she may have gotten confused and thought she was talking to God, right? Mm. Mm. Yes, yeah, Sarah, when she, she laughed. laughed. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, that's a good, uh, good catch. L let's look at uh, verse 13. All right, and, and what I'd like to do here is kind of, Sarai, may, excuse me, Hagar made a conclusion that this person, that this one that she was speaking to is God. Okay? There's arguments that say she didn't know what she was talking about. Okay. There's something in verse 13 that crushes that. It says, then she called the name of the Lord who spoke to her. And that's where it is. You all see it? It's hidden. That thing is hidden. How is, how is, how is Lord written? All caps. What is that? That's Yahweh. Who wrote that? Did Hagar write that? Who wrote that? Moses wrote that. That's Moses that said this, right? Moses is saying, then Hagar, then she, Hagar, called the name of Yahweh who spoke to her. There's no, there, what Jew is going to say, Moses was confused. Can they say that? And then trust the rest of their scriptures? You can't say that. Right? Moses is the one that said, this was Yahweh. That's who she was talking to. Right? And then she tells us that she saw him. Right? So this kind of goes to Ken's, a, a, a bit to Ken's question. Right? She said that, uh, that she, she, we can know that she saw him because what did she think was going to happen? She thought she was going to die because she saw him. Right? She saw him. This is God taking physical form, and not just physical form, in a human body. How do we know that this, this, it just had to be a human body? How do we know it had to be? How did she react when she, when she met him? Was she terrified? Was she, was she frightened? No. No. This is, this is some guy that, that walked up on her and started telling her about her life. Right? This is God revealed in the flesh and the angel of the Lord. Any questions, any pushback to any of that? Yes, sir. So are there any examples, or to, to your point, as I haven't thought about it that way, about the angel of the Lord, and the angel is saying, I will do the X, Y, or Z. It's not saying, oh, the Lord told me to tell you. Yeah. Are there any examples in Scripture, old or new? I know you're dealing with Old Testament right now, yeah. but we can use as a, an example to point to to say, here's an example of an angel um, who appeared to human but it was clear that they were not the Lord Almighty. They were actually just doing some work on behalf of God Almighty, bringing a message saying, the Lord told me to tell you X, Y, you know, whatever the case was. Can you think of an example like that you can point to, particularly in the Old Testament since you, you're oh, dealing with it? I was, you, you, uh, you, you got me there. Because I was, I was just about to say, uh, like Luke 1 uh, makes me think about when, uh, I believe it was Gabriel, uh, showed up to... Um, John's father, um, that would be one. Um, but you're saying any time that a, an angel showed up and said something that, that was not God, an angel that was not God? Yeah, that's what I was, yeah, I was trying to find out if, if there were any examples um, of an angel mm -hmm. showing up and it was yeah. clear it was yeah. not God. It was, it was an angel working on behalf of yeah. God. Mo I, the only, I, 
uh, Pastor Perkins just said Daniel, and I'm trying to run through the examples that I'm thinking about. In, in every instance, I, it seems to me that I remember the name being said of the angel. Um, in Luke 1, I believe he said that he was Gabriel. In Daniel, what's that, Daniel chapter 7, uh, when, he, uh, when Gabriel was speaking to um, Daniel, he said it on the age of Gabriel, I believe, as well. Uh, so those, those would be some. Daniel 9, thank you. Daniel, Daniel chapter 9. Uh, where Gabriel showed up to Daniel. Yes, um, in in and that's I think we're actually about to go there now, uh, and that's in Genesis chapter 18. There were two. There were three men that showed up to that showed up to Abraham, Abram, and um, two of them were angels, right? Uh, but the third one, uh, I think we. Um, we'll see is actually God. So Earl, um, from this passage that you said, would you say every time you see the angel of the Lord, it's not like a typical angel, but it is it is a person of the Godhead? Definitely. From a Christian standpoint. Definitely. I would say the angel of the Lord, I believe that God is teaching this to his people as as we go through scripture, that's what God is teaching them. He's teaching them that. And so I would say, absolutely. Every time you see the angel of the Lord, it is that. So, put this off that question for now, but would you go another step forward and say, this is the second person in the Trinity? Absolutely. Or the third person? I would say the second person. I'd say this is the Son of God. All right. Great questions. Great questions. Okay. Um, on to Genesis 18. Yes. Uh, theophany. Theophany, yeah. Uh huh. Theophany. Mm hmm. Mm hmm. All right. Uh, I'm just going to, this is, because it's really the whole chapter. Obviously, I don't want to read the whole chapter. Let's just look at some select verses uh, in this text. So let's look at uh, verse 1. And in verse 1, it says, Now the Lord, uh, we'll do 1 and 2. Now the Lord appeared to him by the oaks of Mamre while he was sitting at the tent door in the heat of the day, when he lifted up his eyes and looked, behold, there were three men standing opposite him. And when he saw them, he ran from the tent door to meet them and bowed himself to the earth. Right. Um, who appeared to Abraham? Who did they say appeared to him? Yeah, three men and specifically yeah, specifically the Lord. Right? The Lord appeared to him. We see that in verse 1. Okay. Um, let's look at verse 8. Let's skip down to verse 8. And in verse 8 it says, He took curds and milk and the calf which he had prepared and placed it before them, and he was standing by them under the tree as they ate. Okay, so when, you've, when you all envision that, is this a... Is this a uh, like a vision of the Lord, or is this an embodiment somehow of God? When you all envision that, I'm gonna read it again. He took curds and milk, and the calf which he had prepared, and placed it before them, and he was standing by them under the tree, and the, as they ate. How would you all take that? Yes, but in both of them, it would be not physical, right? In a dream, it's not really something in the physical world. And in a vision, it's not really something in a physical world. It's like you were kind of taken and you were placed in a spiritual location. But what I'm saying here is what we see in verse 1, the Lord appeared to him and uh, two others appeared to him while he was sitting at his tent door. Then in verse 8, we see... Well, prior to that, uh, Abraham says, look, I got to get some food for these guys. Let's, let's go make some food, All right? He presents the food to them. In verse 8, it says, he took curds and milk and the calf, which he had prepared, and placed it before them. And he was standing by them under the tree as they ate. Is this physical or was this spiritual? I would say this is, this is definitely physical, All right? This is happening. Right, and it makes me think of, uh, think about when Jesus was resurrected. What did he do? Yeah, 
Right? That's what it makes me think about. Excuse me. Sorry, your physical too. Yeah. <laughs> All right. Um, let's look now at um, verse 16. Okay, verse 16. Then the men rose up from there and looked down towards Sodom, and Abraham was walking with them to send them off. Right? So these are, this is three men walking. Right? They, they just finished eating, now they're walking away. Okay? Again, this strikes me as physical. Right? This is something that's actually happening in the real world. Right? And the Lord is one of these three individuals. All right? And then lastly, um, Maybe not lastly. Lastly, I think, verse 22. Then the men turned away from there and went toward Sodom while Abraham was still standing before the Lord. Right? All of this stuff just makes me, all of it, especially in conjunction, just makes me like, this is real. This is real. We didn't even go into the conversations that they were having that Sarah heard right, and reacted to. Right? So this isn't Abraham, Abraham being taken up to have a vision in any way. This is happening on earth. And in this, one of these individuals is Yahweh, is the Lord. Okay. All right, so this is another example of God being willing, being able to, and willing to present himself as a human. Okay. All right, next one, Genesis 22. Any questions, though? Okay. This next one isn't going to show that, uh, that God uh, presenting himself as human, but it's going to bolster the fact that, that the, this angel of the Lord is actually God, right? Okay, again, I don't necessarily want to read all of this because uh, it's, it's kind of throughout the chapter, but let's read verses 1 and 2, and it says, Now it came about after these things that God tested Abraham and said to him, Abraham, and he said, Here I am. He said, Take now your son, your only son, whom you love, Isaac, and go to the Lord, excuse me, go to the land of Moriah and offer him there as a burnt offering on, uh, on one of the mountains of which I tell you. Okay. When God commands someone to give a burnt offering, who is that burnt offering supposed to be sacrificed to? Yeah, the Lord. Right? He's not going to say sacrifice it to some other God, right? If, when he says, when he commands, an offering to be given, it's to be given to God, okay? All right, let's look at um, verses 11 and 12. Verse 11 says, But the angel of the Lord called to him from heaven and said, Abraham, Abraham. And he said, Here I am. He said, Do not stretch out your hand against the lad and do nothing to him, for now I know that you fear God since you have not withheld your son, your only son, from me. Yeah, it does. <laughs> this is this show sure does. What do we see uh, in verse uh, in verses eleven and twelve? Uh, who did Abraham not withhold his son from? He said God. I would agree. Yeah. It's, it is God, it is. but it is the angel of the Lord. And how do we know? Right? Because in verse 11 at the top, it says, the angel of the Lord called to him from heaven and said, right? This is the angel of the Lord talking. And he says, you have not withheld your son from me. Right? And we just said that sacrifices are made to God. Right? Abraham was sacrificing his son to God. And this angel said, you haven't withheld him from me. Right? It, the angel of the Lord at least thinks he's God. Okay, okay. let me, I think I'm going to skip that. Okay. Um, let's look again at verse uh, 1 and 2, just kind of thinking back. Who gave Abraham the command again? 1 and 2. Who gave Abraham the command? Yeah, God. Okay, let's look at uh, 
think I'm, I think we can just get away with verse 18. Let's look at verse 18. It says, In your seed all the nations of the earth shall be blessed because you have obeyed my voice. Okay, one more time. In your seed all the nations of the earth shall be blessed because you have obeyed my voice. Okay. Who gave Abraham the command? God gave Abraham the command. And in verse 18, whoever speaking said, you're blessed because you obeyed my voice. Because you obeyed my voice. Okay. Who is this one that's speaking? And we can look to verse 15. And again, it's the angel of the Lord. This is the angel of the Lord that's saying, you, look, Abraham, yep, just as Mr. Gene said, you passed the test, right? You're going to be blessed because you obey me. You obey my voice, right? And this is the angel of the Lord speaking. It's God. It's got to be God. So this is another proof that the angel of the Lord is God. All right, any questions there? Yes, yes. That's a, I will say that's a tricky question. <laughs> to, to me, that is a tricky question. And uh, we'll, we'll talk about it a little bit because I don't actually know what I would, I, I probably, I would probably lean to the fact that he wasn't speaking to about himself it, or wasn't saying himself when he said God in that, in that statement. And that's, that's probably sounds strange. All right. Okay. Let's go to uh, Genesis 48. Genesis 48. Okay. So this is uh, at the end of Jacob's life. This is the end of Jacob's life. Uh, he has, he's been gotten back, uh, I'm, I lost for words, I'm, I keep saying reconciled. He wasn't really reconciled with Joseph, but he found out that Joseph was still alive. He's lived in Egypt for a while. He's about to die, All right? So Jacob is about to die. And um, at his death, Joseph wants, to, wants him to bless his sons, All right? So he brings his sons to him, Ephraim and Manasseh, all right, brings his sons to him, and um, he begins to give a blessing over them. I'm going to start at verse 15, all right, Genesis 48, verse 15. And, and think about who this is that's speaking. This is Jacob, all right? If you think about uh, maybe some things in the past that, had, that Jacob's life had in it, um, he, he, you remember when he wrestled? Yeah. You remember when he had a dream of a ladder? Right, all of that stuff. Jacob has encountered God in different ways. And this is, this is what he says in his blessing. Starting at verse 15, it says, He blessed Joseph and said, The God before whom my fathers Abraham and Isaac walked, the God who has been my shepherd all my life to this day, the angel who has redeemed me from all evil, bless the lads. What in the world? Did y'all hear it? Did y'all see it? What did he do? He, who is he, who is he, who is, who is, um, who is Jacob speaking to in his prayer? He's speaking to God, right? And he's, he's speaking to God and he says, the God before whom my fathers, Abraham and Isaac walked, the God who has been my shepherd all my life to this day, the angel who has redeemed me from all evil, bless the lads. Just as natural as can be, he just switched. God, the angel, as if they're the same. And it's because they are. God is the angel. The angel is God. In Jacob's blessing over the children, he entreats God to bless both of Joseph's sons. But he does something strange while making the request of God. He exchanges the title of the God he is speaking to by very naturally exchanging the title, the God, for the title, the angel. 
It is clear that Jacob understood the true identity of the angel whom he had encountered throughout his life. He was indeed Yahweh. Any questions on that one? Yeah, I think that's a definitely an inf unfortunate uh, translation there for us in terms of, because we have this idea of what an angel is, and I think our minds just kind of go to that idea instead of understanding what the, the actual Hebrew word means, uh, messenger. All right, Exodus 3. Okay. All right. Um, just read a few of the first verses here. Uh, I'm going to start at verse 2. It says, The angel of the Lord appeared to him in a blazing fire from the midst of the bush. And he looked, and behold, the bush was burning with fire, yet the bush was not consumed. So Moses said, I must turn aside now and see this marvelous sight while the bush is not burned up. As an aside here, um, Moses uh, described this burning bush as a marvelous sight. And I would agree. Um, I don't claim to know exactly what is being um, maybe taught here with God coming as a burning, uh, as, a, as a fire in the midst of a burning uh, of a bush. But I do say uh, that something it has to be along these lines. For God to be able to come into the world as, a, as the consuming fire that he is and to place himself in the midst of a bush and that bush not burn, it's, it's amazing. I've been doing some burning uh, in, my, in, my, in the backyard and if you have a dry bush and you throw that thing over a, a, a hot flame, it it catches instantly, and it is consumed so fast. But what we have here is, and it's, it's, just, it's, it's the natural thing that you would expect to happen. What we have here is a bush that is not being consumed, even by the God who is himself a consuming fire. That's what his, his picture is when he shows himself in fire. He is a consuming fire. What, I'm, what I want to say here is this is showing us that God can, he can be in the midst of something that should burn up in his presence, but it not burn up. In the same way that God can be in the midst of this bush and this bush not burn up, God can be in the midst of his people and they not burn up. That's a beautiful picture, right? We can be close to God if he so chooses, right? He can stay his consuming nature from us, however he does it, he can do that. Right? I think that's a beautiful picture, and I, I agree with Moses, that is a marvelous sight. Okay, so let's look at verse 2. According to verse 2, who appeared to Moses? Who appeared to Moses? The angel of the Lord, all right? Look down at verse 16. According to verse 16, who appeared to Moses? Who is it? Yahweh. Yeah. The God of Moses' fathers. All right. So, according to verse 2, the angel of the Lord appeared to Moses. According to verse 16, Yahweh appeared to Moses. Okay. All right. Uh, verse 2 again. Who was in the midst of the bush? Who is it? According to verse 2. Mm -hmm. The angel of the Lord. Okay, according to verse 4, who was in the midst of the bush? Yeah. God. Okay, again, we're seeing that the angel of the Lord and God are interchangeable, interchangeable. Okay, 
How did the angel of the Lord identify himself in verse 6? How did the angel of the Lord identify himself in verse 6? Yeah, I am the God of your father. Absolutely. Yeah. And then how did he respond? How did Moses respond to that? He hid his face. He hid his face. Why? Why? He was afraid to look at God. He was afraid to look at God. The last part of verse 6. Mm-hmm. Yep, he hid his face because he was afraid to look at God. Okay? So, what, who did Moses understand he was looking at and he was speaking to? God. That's what he understood. All right? Is there any way that the author who's writing this text could have misunderstood what Moses was thinking at this time? <laughs> no, no, because it was Moses, right? Moses was, he knew, he's, he's telling us exactly what he thought. He said, this is God that I'm speaking to. I know it's God. Let me hide my face so I don't die. Okay. Here's, all right. According to verses 4, 6, 11, 13, 14, 15, and 16, Moses was speaking with God. Okay. Out of those verses, God is giving a self-identification in verses 6, 14, and 16. Okay. Here's a question. How does Moses identify the one he is speaking with in verse 2? Who does he say appeared in the bush? Yes. He said the angel of the Lord. Here's the question, though. How did he identify him as the angel of the Lord? Because if we look, somebody look at verse 6. Somebody else, please look at uh, verse 14 and someone else 16. How did God identify himself in verse 6? That's what he said. I'm the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. Okay? All right. What about verse uh, 14? You said, I am? Okay. All right? So, um, I am, right? And then verse 16. Yeah, right? But here, look back at verse 2. How did he identify God? Angel of the Lord. God never identified himself as the angel of the Lord. This is Moses telling us that this God who has given me his name, I am, who is the father of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, this same God is the angel of the Lord. He's, he's teaching his people, I can enter into this physical creation, and I can reveal myself as a human being. There's no reason for anyone to reject that. Like God is teaching. And we, we're, just at, uh, we're just at Exodus. Right? He, he keeps doing this. Keeps doing it. I would say, yeah, looking back at uh, how the Israelites lived at the time uh, and how they turned on God very quickly, um, I would say that many of them didn't believe. Uh, the vast majority of them didn't believe. Right, God kept them in the, in the wilderness for 40 years because of their unbelief. Um, so certainly I would say that. Um, but also, uh, I would say modern day Jews would fit that same bill. Right? They don't believe, uh, like, and that's kind of why we're going through this, because the, 
some of them don't believe that God can manifest himself in physical form. They don't believe that he would ever show up as a human, right? There's, they would say, there's no way he can do that, right? And, but why? Why would they say that? When we can look to these scriptures that are just abundantly clear that that's what he's teaching you. Well, the, the reason is because they don't, they don't trust the scriptures. They're just like anyone else who doesn't trust the scriptures, anyone else who's unregenerate, who, would, who does not believe uh, what God says in his word. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, I think that's probably a good place to stop uh, for today. I did not get as far as I thought it was, but um, that's probably a good place. Is, are there any other questions? What did Moses think that meant? Uh, I don't know that Moses necessarily thought uh, anything at the time. I don't, you know, I, I don't really know. Uh, what do I think it means? Um, did you want? Did you have something to say with this? Yeah. Okay. Yeah, I was going to say that um, God basically declares that He is, and that's all He has to declare. We we have a lot of titles for God, but he declares to us that he is, and that's all he has to give you. Yeah, I, um, when I see that, when, that he says, I am that I am, uh, or I am who I am, it makes me think that God is saying, I am my attributes, right? I, I don't have anything to compare myself against. I, I exist before all things. I can't say I am like this or I am like that and truly get the essence of who God is. God is like himself. He's like no one else. So he can't compare himself to anyone else. So he can only compare himself to himself. So when God says I am, he is who he is. And if we, um, uh, if I can find it. Is it uh, Exodus 34, I think it is where God appears to, uh, isn't that where God appears to Moses? Okay, yeah, and when he appears to Moses, uh, I believe he says his name there. If you can help me out, if you find it before I did. Old, Old Testament, Exodus 34, I think. It's either 33 or 34, where God is speaking with Moses and he tells him his name. Say it again. In Exodus 3.13. Yeah, where he just says, I am. Yes. All right. And, and also, here it is. And also, so yes, I agree with that. And then in Exodus 34, uh, verse 5, it says, The Lord descended in the cloud and stood there with him as he called upon the name of the Lord. Then the Lord passed in front of him and proclaimed, The Lord, the Lord God, compassionate and gracious, slow to anger, and abounding in loving kindness and truth, who keeps loving kindness for thousands who forgives iniquity, transgression, and sin, yet he will by no means leave the guilty unpunished, visiting the iniquity of fathers on the children and on the grandchildren to the third and fourth generations. And if, if my memory serves me, I think in verse 33 he said that he, was pro he would proclaim his name. Is that right? That he would proclaim his name before him. So this is God proclaiming his name. So his name is I am who I am. But then he gives characteristics of who he is, or attributes of who he is. 3319, yeah, thank you. So when I, when I, my understanding of it is God is saying, uh, I am compassionate. I am gracious. I am slow to anger. I am abounding in loving kindness. That's who I am, right? So God is who he is. I am who I am, and this is who I am. I'm a compassionate God. I'm a gracious God. I'm a loving God. 
Never changes. All right, good question. Okay. All right, let's pray. Heavenly Father, we do thank you once again for your great loving kindness. Lord, as we look at your name, uh, the name that you proclaimed before Moses, uh, we can say amen to those things because we know them for ourselves that they are true. Lord God, we thank you for your word and for the clarity of your word. And we pray that you will allow these words to reach lost souls so that they might be saved. In Jesus' name, amen. Uh, hope, hopefully, hopefully.